The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I inform the House that, uh, as I'm sure members know, the Prime Minister will be absent from question time today. He's travelling to Hobart along with the Leader of the Opposition and a number of other members to attend the funeral of the former Premier of Tasmania, Jim Bacon. I know uh, that uh, all members would join me in saying that uh, thoughts again go out to his family and friends at a time like this, uh, and I will answer questions on the Prime Minister's behalf. I thank the Acting Prime Minister. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Lawler, Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Minister, I refer to Labor's policy ideas for a new generation smart Medicare card, and I note that in the budget papers the government indicated it may consider such an innovation. Minister, or Minister, Minister for Small Business, the Member for Lawler has the call. May consider such an innovation. Minister, will Will the government now work with Labor in a bipartisan way to reform Minister our for health small system? Minister, will the government now work with Labor in a bipartisan way to reform our health system by introducing a new Medicare Smart Card, which gives timely access to electronic health records while protecting patient confidentiality? The Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I'm always delighted uh, when the uh, opposition adopts government policy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Another yeah. backflip. Yeah. Another backflip, like the PBS backflip. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr Speaker, the first, the first scripted speech that I gave as Minister for Health back in November last year was all about electronic health Order. records and access to Member electronic for health records. Ask question. Uh, Mr Speaker, not only uh, did, we, uh, did we make an announcement in the budget, but we have been getting on with the job. I happen to have here, 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 Mr. Speaker, a Medicare smart card, a prototype Medicare smart card. I have it here. The, me the member for Lawler is welcome to inspect it. And Mr. Speaker, and Mr. Speaker, these cards, these cards uh, will be rolling out in Tasmania from the end of July this year. Yeah. Yeah. What a member for Lawler. The Honourable Member for Eden Monero. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, would the Minister inform the House of the attitude of countries in East Asia to cooperation with the United States? Is Australia's alliance with the United States an asset in our relationship in Asia? Are there any alternative views? The Honourable the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member Farid Monero for his question and uh, for his interest because, as he would know only too well, the vast majority of countries in Asia value very much their relationship with the United States and they have a close relationship with that country. They have regular military training exercises, they have counter-terrorism cooperation. Indeed, to such an extent, uh, their counter-terrorism cooperation has uh, led to the arrest of Hanbali and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, the regional support for the proliferation security initiative is growing. Japan, Singapore, Japan and Singapore are core members. New Zealand and Thailand are participating in meetings um, on the PSI. Um, Mr. Speaker, importantly, Japan supports the missile defence initiative. The defence minister Ishiba um, said on the, at the end of last year, missile defence is indispensable for Japan's security. Significantly, Mr. Speaker, many uh, countries in Asia have troops in Iraq supporting the Iraqi people and the coalition more generally. Japan has uh, over 500, South Korea 660, and uh, they're proposing to spend, send a further 3,000. Mongolia, the Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand, they all have troops. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, this explodes the myth which is propagated in particular by the opposition and some of their supporters, that having uh, involvement in Iraq damages us in Asia and having close relations with the United States damages us um, in Asia. Um, indeed, what is interesting is that countries in Asia, countries in Asia are, interested, are interested in a free trade agreement with the United States. Singapore has a free trade agreement with the United States. 
negotiations with Thailand are to start. Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand and Brunei all have uh, um, trade and investment uh, facilitation agreements with the United States. And Mr. Speaker, the Labor Party believes that you cannot have close relations with the United States and close relations with Asia. The Labor Party believes that the two are mutually contradictory, and as a result, Labor argues that we should downgrade our relationship with the United States. We know that they want to pull the troops out of Iraq. Um, they reject the United States' right to defend its people from ballistic <laughs> missile attack by opposing the Missile Defence Initiative. They are opposed, apparently, to the Proliferation Security Initiative, even though 60 countries support it. And when it comes to the free trade uh, agreement with the United States, the Labor Party rejected that at the outset. And let us remember what the Leader of the Opposition said. If we were asked to vote on it today or in the Parliament tomorrow, we would be opposing it. And since then, the Labor Party has constantly attacked the free trade agreement. They've raised the phony issue of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme cost rises, Order. where in fact you're voting for cost rises in the, uh, of uh, pharmaceuticals. So you're against it if it's got anything to do with the free trade agreement, and it doesn't. But you're in favour of it if it has nothing to do with the free trade agreement. The logic of that, I think, would escape almost all human beings, and it certainly escapes the electorate. Um, the, it, and when it came to JSCOP, the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, it's perfectly clear that many, but not quite all, Labor members wanted to sign off in support of the Free Trade Agreement. And at the last moment, somebody contacted them and said, you better not go that far. And we understand that the contact came from the office of the Leader of the Opposition. In other words, instructing committee members Member on how to vote make sure they don't support the free trade agreement because at the end labor wants to maintain its image member of, labor party Swan. wants to maintain member its image Swan. of being viscerally anti-american which the labor party leadership is and the labor party believes that it will enhance australia's status in asia by downgrading our relations with our alliance partner mr speaker it will have the reverse effect it will make Australia look weak. It will make Australia isolationist, and you win no respect in Asia by being weak. Member for Brisbane. The honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Deputy Mr. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Children and Youth. Has the minister seen comments in today's Melbourne Age from Reverend Tim Costello? arguing that the government's maternity payment should be paid in fortnightly instalments rather than as a lump sum. And I quote, a baby bonus isn't meant to be a pokey bonus. It should be the children, not the gaming industry, who benefit. Order. The member for Jagger Jagger has the call. Like this, member for Lindsay. Like this, you know what's happening. Member for Lindsay. Member for Jagger Jagger. Oh. Member Jagger Jagger, resume, resume his seat. The member for McKellar on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I, I consider, as do others, um, obviously by their reaction, to consider that language to be unparliamentary, and I'd ask to be withdrawn. Order. There is nothing unparliamentary in the comments made by the member for Jagger Jagger. She has the call. Thank you. Uh, Minister, wouldn't it be more responsible to adopt Labor's baby care payment rules and pay families on a fortnightly basis, as Reverend Costello suggests? When the House has come to order, the member for Lindsay. The Honourable the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Deputy uh, Opposition Leader for her question. Indeed, it's always been the, uh, the government's philosophy that when it comes to uh, spending patterns, we should leave that up to Australian families. And uh, what I find extraordinary today, not just the maternity member payment, for Jelly but indeed even comments made by the member, member for, for Lilly, Reed. 
saying that uh, we should almost mandate that people should get fortnightly payments, almost suggesting that Australian families can't look after their own financial yeah. affairs. I mean, this is, the, this is the absurd Order. situation and the proposition being advocated by the Australian Labor Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is, that is, we shouldn't A, be giving lump sum payments, B, we shouldn't be giving a $3,000 maternity payment. It should be uh, uh, put over a fortnightly payment. Member the, whole for Fraser. Notion, the whole notion is that the suggestion by the Australian Labor Party is that Australian families are irresponsible, they can't look after their own financial affairs, and therefore, therefore it's the government has to legislate how they be paid. I mean, this is a ridiculous notion. And indeed, all the comments that I have received, particularly from another, a lot of expecting mothers, are absolutely delighted that they will receive that $3,000 payment, which they can use, of course, for the provision of their children or for their home. Now, in circumstances, in circumstances where we deem, where we deem that a, an individual or a young mother is perhaps at risk, there could be a drug dependency problem, there could be alcohol issues, then there is discretion. There is discretion by the Secretary of the Department to look at those particular areas, those narrow areas, to ensure that that money is not all blown in one hit but used responsibly. The, mem but the, member fact, for the, the fact of the point is, the fact of the point is that the Australian Labor Party want to invade households' lives. I mean, last week they were telling us, last week they were telling us that families are irresponsible. So therefore, they have to ban advertising on television. We've had notions from the leader of the opposition where we've got contract parental contract orders, and today, of course, they're suggesting. Today, of course, they're suggesting that Australian families are not responsible enough. Therefore, every payment we should be is a fortnightly payment. Three thousand dollar payment is a good payment, and we stand by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The honourable member for Canning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer inform the House of recent trends in relation to living standards? What are the factors that have underpinned these trends? And are there any risks to further improvements in Australia's standard of living over the period ahead? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Canning for his uh, question. And uh, I can inform uh, the House that living standards in Australia have been strongly rising over the last eight years. And, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this is reflected in uh, various surveys of public opinion, uh, including uh, surveys about whether or not people have optimism for the future. And uh, today, Mr Speaker, a news poll uh, reports uh, a, uh, a survey uh, where people were polled about their standard of living, whether they uh, expected it to uh, improve, stay the same, get worse or be uncommitted. Uh, and those that uh, either thought that they would maintain their standard of living or improve it over the uh, next six months was the highest, uh, at the highest level, Mr Speaker, of 84 per cent. That's a good thing, isn't it? 84 per cent of Australians feel confident enough about their standards of living, that to uh, be confident that they're either going to maintain or improve standards of living over the next six months, Mr. Speaker. Um, and indeed, uh, when you look at those who thought uh, that things were going to get worse, it's uh, the lowest uh, since 1997 in this uh, survey. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, if you go back to uh, 1985, uh, it's the lowest that it's been recorded uh, by that particular survey. So, Mr Speaker, people are confident and optimistic about the future, and that's good for our country, uh, that our country feels optimistic and confident. And there are reasons why people feel optimistic and confident about their future in Australia. Order. Mr Member for Speaker, uh, the real household disposable income, the key summary measure of economic well-being, has increased by 28 per cent. So, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, household disposable income has increased under this government. Uh, unemployment uh, at 5.5 per cent is at a 23-year low, Mr Speaker. Uh, jobs have increased significantly since 1996. 1 1.3 million jobs have been uh, developed in Australia since 1996, uh, Mr Speaker, and they've been widely uh, shared around Australia. Uh, we can welcome to the House uh, the children and companions from Camp Quality in Darwin that are visiting us uh, today. Uh, 
uh, Mr. Oh, yeah. Speaker, uh, and uh, the uh, the territory is one of those areas which uh, has been sharing in uh, job creation and increasing standards of living. We've had continuous growth uh, over the last eight years. Interest rates are at their lowest level in 30 years. Inflation is down towards the bottom of the band of two to three percent. And best of all, Mr. Speaker, at the national level, uh, Labor's debt. Labor's debt of $96 billion has been reduced under this government by $70 billion in net terms. So, Mr Speaker, that set Australia up for uh, much better opportunities in the future, but we can't relax. Economic management is hard, it's difficult, and we have to maintain the pressure in relation to that, Mr Speaker. If you can't govern a local council, you can't govern a country. And, uh, Mr Speaker, that's why it's important that we continue strong economic management in this country, that we don't lose focus, and, Mr Speaker, that the coalition continues to work in relation to economic management for our children's future. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Lily. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is directed to the Minister for Children and Youth. Can the Minister confirm that in a press release yesterday, the Minister for Family and Community Services said in relation to the government's one-off $600 payment that, and I quote, if Centrelink had made a mistake, there would be no attempt to recover the bonus payments, unquote. Can the minister confirm that this advice means a family from New South Wales will keep their double payment of $2,400 mistakenly made to them in respect of their two children? Minister, isn't it the government's decision to let families keep this overpayment just another cynical election bribe. The Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. Well, I must uh, thank the member for Lily for his question. I have a greater chance of getting Dorothy Dixis from the opposition than from my uh, <laughs> colleagues here. But uh, I do respect the Leader of the House and the Deputy Leader. But um, uh, indeed, uh, I must also thank the, uh, the member for Swan's office for uh, sending an email through. Not often we uh, receive, uh, he makes up all these, uh, these cases. And indeed, I think it must have been from the chap from Cooper's Plain, perhaps, who. Uh, was uh, uh, getting in contact with the member for Lilly's office, but let's put this into perspective. As it is now, 1.95 million families have received their bonus payment this week, and of course, uh, whatever is remaining up until, of course, uh, end of business tomorrow. 1.95 million Australian families have received that one-off payment. That's a good news. Now, and of course, they're going to get that payment again. They're going to get that payment again next year in September. Now, it's interesting. Last week, the member for Lilly was complaining bitterly that we weren't paying people enough. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, middle of last week, he was then complaining that we, we weren't going to guarantee the value of the $600 into the future. Today, he's complaining that we're paying them two more. Uh, the facts are, Mr. Speaker, this is a, a, a constant pattern of sour grapes. It's yeah. our great because it is this yeah. government, it is this government through good Science, economic management that has been able to deliver this $19.2 billion increase in payment to family tax benefit over the next four years. We've heard no policy suggestions on how they're going to help Australian families from the Australian Labor Party. And the only guarantee, the only guarantee that we have is that the member for Lilly and the Australian Labor Party have refused to guarantee this $600 payment. He smirks. And I'm sure the over 9,000 families in Lilly would not appreciate the smirk that Member, you're giving, where you have Minister, failed, failed to guarantee that $600 payment, chair. Mr. Speaker. And interestingly, uh, I'd like to just uh, quote a, a few because uh, people are very grateful of the payment that they're receiving. Yeah. They're very grateful. Indeed, um, I noticed uh, Adele Horan writing in the Sydney Morning Herald today. Uh, talks about um, a lady, uh, Lindy Mont from Uniting Care Burnside, senior manager for Western Sydney. Western Sydney, of course, we know that well. 
Uh, she turned up on Friday for a mother's meeting at Dernside. Only two of the ten regulars were there. My staff tell me the women were excited. They'd been planning what, where to spend their money, and it was on kids' clothes. Another example from the, from the, from the uh, Deputy, Deputy Prime Minister in Burke, Sally Bryant, a commu council community worker, said she'd, she had seen no negative impact on residents. Most people have been strapped for cash because of the drought and the lack of casual work. They look upon this money with gratitude. And of course, uh, if we go to the Central Coast, a very good article here, I might say, um, in the Daily Telegraph edition there with, by Jody Sharp, where uh, she has said, for families like mine, we are middle income earners with two children. This government initiative is a godsend. I was considering having to work more hours in the near future, and now I won't have to. I now make an informed decision at election time, and so far the government is showing me what I want to see, and that is it cares about young families and children who are the future of our country. Keep it up, Mr Howard. There's no doubt, Mr. no doubt, Mr Speaker, that it's the coalition government that's continuing to deliver, and of course, as far as payments are concerned, payments will always go to uh, only eligible individuals who are receiving the bonus, and of course, if there is fraudulent activity, then of course we expect them to repay it. The Honourable Member for Farrah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. Would the Treasurer inform the House of the economic imperative to keep the pharmaceutical benefits scheme sustainable? Are there any other more flexible approaches to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and the costing of policies? The Honourable the Treasurer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Farrah for her question. And I uh, can uh, inform the House that there is an economic imperative to keep the pharmaceutical benefits scheme financially sustainable. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, as I said uh, when these measures were introduced back in 2002, no area of Commonwealth expenditure is growing faster. It increased 14 per cent before we announced that measure, 14 per cent afterwards. Its cost has quadrupled over the last decade. And, Mr Speaker, according to our intergenerational uh, report, would rise to a very substantial proportion of GDP over the next 40 years. Mr Speaker, the co-payment is an instrument of good policy. Uh, it was introduced, in fact, by Labor with the support of the coalition, a $2.50 co-payment. And, Mr Speaker, uh, for the reasons that the Labor Party introduced it in 1990, this government announced in the 2002 budget uh, that it would be increased so that we could share the cost of new pharmaceuticals between uh, the taxpayer and the person concerned with an adequate safety net. So, Mr Speaker, there is a good economic and health case and public policy case uh, behind the measures which the government announced in relation to the PBS. And the Labor Party, which now supports it, could, of course, make that good case as to why they are supporting it. But the problem for the Labor Party, of course, is they can't actually enunciate the case for supporting these good policy measures because for 25 months the Labor Party engaged in opportunism, it engaged in needless scare tactics, Mr Speaker, and it tried to defeat good policy in this country for its own shabby political advantage. Uh, let me quote, for example, from uh, Mr. Um, Mr Stephen Smith, the member for Perth, I believe, uh, who, uh, who said this. He said, uh, Treasurer Costello confirms the government's proposal to increase PBS co-payments across the board never had anything to do with health and everything to do with propping up a budget bottom line. That's what Mr Smith said. Well, well, what is the reason for Labor Party's support for these measures? Wouldn't have anything to do with propping up a bottom line, would it, Mr Speaker? Or take what was said this morning on AM. What was said this morning on AM that many Labor MPs are still smarting over the prescription medicines backflip after arguing for two years that making drugs more expensive would hit the poorest and sickest. Dumb and lousy is how the unhappy MPs see the new policy. Now listen to this. I asked the House to listen to this. When one angry frontbencher was asked how he could sell it to the voters, he answered, pretend it didn't happen. <laughs>
Mr Speaker, pretend it didn't happen. Well, can I say the Labor Party is making a very good job of pretending it didn't happen? Because if you look up the ALP website as of this moment, click it up. There is absolutely no mention on the ALP website that the Australian Labor Party is supporting the government's PBS measures. It just doesn't exist. It's almost as if it was never announced. And after making sure, Mr Speaker, that it wasn't on the website that they'd backflipped, I wondered what would happen if we went to Labor Party websites to see whether they were still maintaining their opposition on their own websites. Very interesting. If you go to the website of the member for Jagger Jagger, oh, really? Mr Speaker, she still has a statement uh, up there, a statement up there which she put up there in June 2002. Listen to this. This is how the Labor Party was campaigning. Pensioners such as Mr Bill and Mrs Thelma Rogers from West Heidelberg are unhappy with the Howard government's proposed increases on the cost of prescription, <laughs> Jenny Macklin, federal member for Jager Jager, said today. I wonder if the member for Jager Jager has rung back uh, Bill and Thelma Rogers and told Bill and Thelma that she supports these measures. <laughs> I wonder if she has. It was good enough to bring Bill and Thelma into the public debate when they could be used to oppose PBS measures, wasn't it? I wonder if she's had the decency to ring up Bill and Thelma. <laughs> Mr Speaker, uh, then we have a, uh, a long statement there about uh, Bill and Thelma's plight, Mr Speaker, and then, and then the statement finishes up by saying this. Listen to this, the member for Jager Jager. Still up on the website, by the way. I would like to assure local residents that the Labor Party will strongly oppose these proposed increases in the cost of prescriptions. I have also created a petition to put pressure on the government to stop this unfair proposal. Listen to this, it's still there on the website. Please contact my office on 9459 1411 if you would like a copy of this petition and I will make sure your voice is heard in Parliament. <laughs> well, well, can I suggest a member for Jaga Jaga bring back every person that has signed that petition and tell every person that has signed the petition that the petition is now closed, Mr Speaker, <laughs> that there is now no longer putting your signature on this petition to oppose the PBS is not going to do much good. And could I suggest maybe, just maybe, now that the Labor Party has changed its position, just maybe you could ring every one of those people that signed your petition and say it was all a fraud, it was all opportunism, the Labor Party supports this policy, and I'm sorry to have misled you over the last two years. The Honourable Member for Lily. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is directed to the Minister for Children and Youth. Can the Minister give a guarantee to the many families who have purchased essential household items and children's clothes with their $600 payment that none of them will be forced to return these items? after the election because of a government clawback clause in its fa family payment legislation. Member, <coughs> Minister. Minister, isn't the government's one-off payment like a buy-now, pay-later scheme? Minister, given your last answer, is the minister going to send them a bill after they have voted? Member for MacArthur. Minister. Honourable Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. Well, Mr. Speaker, the ALP are totally desperate, aren't they? Totally desperate. Minister for I think I really, as I said in my previous question, I really think this is uh, this is sour grapes because it's been this government, it's been the Howard Anderson government, through good economic management, through good economic management. But particularly by our treasurer, particularly by our treasurer, that we've been able to deliver this dividend back to Australian families. The only thing Australian families have to worry about, if they purchase items, if they purchase items anticipating they're going to receive more family tax benefit in the future, is from the member for Lilly and the Australian Order, Labor Party, Lilly. who member have for Lilly. refused refused to guarantee that $600 payment 
from 2005 to the future. I mean, this is the whole facade. The whole facade. Last week, not enough. This week, too much. But what we do know, what we do know, is the Australian Labor Party has still not come up with any family policies. Indeed, indeed, they are. So now they, they shouldn't be receiving it. Now the member for Lily is suggesting that families, even his own electorate, shouldn't be receiving this payment. Is that what you're suggesting? Order, Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I know it's not you suggesting that, but the member for Lily is. The and facts I'm... are that if Australian families are concerned about family tax benefit, then their concern should be directed at the Australian Labor Party, who have refused who are going to claw it back through the Latham lunge next year if ever they have control of the Treasury benches and take that $600 payment away from them. The Honourable Member for Page. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is directed to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Transport and Regional Services. Member for Macmillan. Would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House of the recently announced federal government funding for New South Wales roads? How do these levels of funding compare with road funding announced in the New South Wales budget? The Acting Prime Minister. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And I must say I enjoyed my time up there looking at some of those projects you've been talking about that need addressing for so long that will be under Auslink. We recently announced uh, Auslink, of course, uh, and it does highlight some very major works to be undertaken in New South Wales. Indeed, the construction budget for New South Wales goes up by 76 per cent over the next five years. Uh, we really will be presiding over some very serious infrastructure upgrades in that state. And that includes, of course, duplicating the Hume Highway and the Pacific Highway, so that we can get to the point in this country where we have our major capital cities uh, increasingly linked up by dual carriageway. Now, Mr Speaker, um, uh, Minister for Roads in New South Wales, Carl Scully, led me to believe that he was about to obviously do something really fantastic. I thought he must be. His reactions indicated that he had something that was so big and so spectacular that it would make everything we were doing pale into insignificance. He called our 76 per cent increase in the construction budget for New South Wales a disgrace and said it fell well short. And so it was that I was waiting to see what he would produce. Yep. Now, the headlines were pretty spectacular in New South Wales' budget this week. They said it included a record roads budget. And Mr Scully had a very colourful song to sing about it. He said that 2004 uh, uh, 05 was a landmark year with a record allocation involving huge increases. Well, Mr Speaker, we must be reading different budget documents. The NRMA Access Economics analysis of the New South Wales budget shows that next financial year's capital expenditure on roads, that is what you actually spend on building them, has dropped by $22 million since 2002 and 2003. Uh, uh, there had been a drop that year of $34 million from the previous year. So in the past two years alone, road building has gone backwards $56 million in New South Wales before you take inflation to, into account. But, Mr Speaker, there's more than that. Do you know what we found when we actually had a look at the projects they'd listed in this giant increase in their New South Wales roads budget? They've all been announced before. Over 20 per cent of them are actually Australian government roads oh, they're announcements. Surprise. They're federal government roads. Their magnificent new roads program is one-fifth at least ours. When you actually look at, the, look at it closely, the drop in New South Wales' actual commitment to roads construction over the last two years is actually $250 million before inflation. So this massive increase turns out to be a very significant decrease. Worse than that, of course, is that at the same time that that's been happening, motor vehicle taxes and charges in New South Wales have increased by $400 million. So there you go. Quite a windfall. Quite a windfall indeed. Mr Scully was so desperate that in his media statement the first project that he trumpeted, the first project, what was it? West Wing, the Western Sydney Orbital, $110 million. But how much of that money is state? None. None, Mr Speaker. It's Australian Order. government money. It's Australian government money. So, Mr Speaker, I want to make this point. It is time, it is time that the Australian electors started to contemplate what life under a Latham Labor government would be like. It is time they started to think through. And where might they find some clues on what it might be like, Mr Speaker? 
Well, there are some people around Liverpool who could probably give them a pretty good idea. You could think back to what it was like when, uh, when the Labor Party was last in office, and you can contemplate uh, you know, having their modern version of those days treasurer, as Mr Crean, with his hand in your pocket. And you could, uh, you could also, though, Mr Speaker, you could have a bit of a look at how the state governments run things. And, you know, Mr Speaker, what it shows is that it's very expensive to run nanny states. It's very expensive. Your taxes go up and up and up and up, so New South Wales motorists are paying more and more and more. It's sort of a bit like that magic pudding thing. At the same time, of course, your services come down and the amount of money spent on capital works comes down, but it's all covered with the most extraordinary fudge, Mr Speaker. And that's what we've seen in New South Wales with their road budget. We announced a 76 per cent increase in road building and, according to them, it's a disgrace. At the same time, according to them, a $250 million decline before inflation in road funding is a landmark achievement. People ought to remember what it's like living under a Labor government and start thinking about just what sort of a shambles Mr Latham would run. Yeah. Yeah. The member for Hasluck. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Children and Youth. Is the Minister aware that some families who cancelled their fortnightly family tax benefit payments to avoid getting debts and who are now expecting a lump sum payment before the end of the financial year have been told by Centrelink that they are no longer registered and are ineligible for the one-off $600 payment? Can the Minister confirm how many families who took the government's advice and move from taking fortnightly to end-of-year payments to avoid debts will Order. miss out on the government's $600? Order. The Honourable the Minister for Family and Youth Affairs. Well, Order. Mr. Uh, Minister has Mr. the call. Uh, the Speaker, um, one of the things that we did do when the new taxation system came into place in the year 2000, when family tax benefit was, or we repackaged 12 into three payments, and of course family tax benefit part A, family tax benefit part B and the childcare benefit. And at that time there was a decision, I think a very wise decision made by the government, where parents could have a choice. They could receive it as a fortnightly payment or they could receive it as a lump sum. And indeed there's been a lot more Australian families now choosing to take that lump sum. Now to answer your question, and I'd be interested if you have any specific cases if you'd like to uh, refer Minister. them to us. But for those Australian families that were receiving a lump sum at the end of last year, uh, it was a decision made that those people receiving a lump sum would be entitled to that $600 payment. And if they received the lump sum last year, then they would be getting that $600 payment or multiples of it, depending on the number of children that they have. Uh, and again, I just want to reassure the parliament that the greatest risk, the greatest risk to Australian families when it comes to family tax benefit is the Australian Labor Party's position that they have failed to guarantee the $600 increase to the base rate really? and to the minimum rate in the year 2005 and beyond. And I hope that Australian families that are watching this broadcast or listening to this broadcast today will go to their local ALP members in the House of Representatives and their senators and say, why haven't you guaranteed that $600 payment that we are receiving now as a bonus by the, by the coalition government because of our good economic management, and they will receive another one, those eligible for family tax benefit, in September. They will all receive that payment if they're eligible for family tax benefit. Why aren't they guaranteed that payment by the Australian Labor Party in years to come? This is just purely sour grapes on behalf of the Labor Party. And it's, 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 it's fantastic that we're able to assist the 1.95 million Australian families who are very grateful that they've been able to receive this payment. Yeah. More, more. For Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Trade. Would the Minister inform the House of organised opposition to the United States Free Trade Agreement? Would the Minister also inform the House how the government's trade policy initiatives stand to create thousands of Australian jobs? The Honourable the Minister for Trade. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, thank the member for Patterson and my next-door neighbour for the, the question, and uh, recognise his support of all government the initiatives that Wills. are uh, put in place to generate more jobs for more Australians, and uh, particularly uh, in his part of New South Wales that he uh, represents very, very well the in Minister generating jobs. 
Minister for Trade, resume your seat. Yes, the, the member for Brisbane on a point of order. Point of order. This matter is not only on the notice paper, but the debate was in fact adjourned to enable question time to take place, and the question is out of order. Yes. And it's quite reasonable for the member for Brisbane to raise a point of order on the matter of anticipation. I understand that. Um, consistent with the action taken by previous occupiers of the chair, the question is not out of order. I need to monitor the answer to ensure that the answer, answer does not anticipate substantial parts of the debate. Uh, that, that's the position taken by previous occupiers of the chair, and I'll listen closely to the minister's reply. The minister. Dougie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, uh, the question went to the government's uh, trade policy initiatives that stand to create thousands of jobs. Now, the question uh, also went, I must say, to the question of organised opposition, which clearly was not necessarily part of the debate, and, was, and so the minister has the call. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. And, uh, the overriding objective of our trade policy is to create opportunities for Australian exporters and to generate many thousands of jobs for future Australians. Uh, of course that's the objective and, uh, and I would expect it would be the objective of any government in this country uh, to expand well, and, and minister, see the economy grow to generate. Minister, minister resume his seat. A member for Brisbane on a point of order. Mr Speaker, not only is it anticipating debate, it's repeating parts of the debate we've already had. The very points being made by the minister now have in fact been in the debate. It is clearly anticipating debate. Member for Brisbane, I was listening. I order. I, I had already responded to the member for Brisbane's perfectly reasonable point of order by indicating the obligations on the chair. I had, in fact, taken the liberty of pointing out to the minister that the first part of the question had little, if anything, to do with the legislation currently before the House, and I had called the minister. I'm listening closely to his response. No, no, no. A member for Brisbane. My point, of, my point of order is that the comments now being made by no. the minister are in fact the very words that are being used in the debate. By any comprehension of the standing orders, it is anticipating debate. And then let me order. Let me reassure the member for Brisbane that this is a matter which obviously I had anticipated may occur because of the legislation before the House and the and the interest in the free trade agreement, and for that reason I had consulted the clerk and I'm listening prior to question time, and I'm listening closely to the minister's reply, having previously checked House of Reps practice myself. The minister has the call. The minister will focus on trade opportunities for Australia. The minister. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And as I was saying, that the clear objective of the government's trade policy is to generate new export opportunities economic growth and therefore uh, jobs growth in Australia to generate new jobs in the Australian economy. Uh, the member for Paterson also asked about uh, any opposition to this, uh, this policy objective and of course in recent weeks we have seen that and uh, in our efforts to promote trade and uh, to promote new jobs we have seen opposition from the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union's uh, Doug Cameron. Now I note that the, uh, the member that raised the point of order doesn't necessarily belong to that particular union. Uh, but uh, this month, uh, this Your month we are again seeing this month we are again seeing the militant action of the AMWU, who are uh, pressing, who are who are pressing uh, uh, the uh, the members of the opposition uh, in the Senate on the issue of jobs Member losses. For Carayo. As, uh, and and Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, we've seen we've seen the AMWU uh, waste hundreds of thousands of dollars of their members' money. On an advertising campaign against government's policy, against the government's policy. Member for now, Wills. Now, Mr. Speaker. Minister, now, Mr. Speaker, can Minister, you imagine? The member can for you Wills. imagine? Minister has Mr. Speaker, can you imagine? Uh, can you imagine an advertising campaign Lincoln. against the creation I of 30,000 jobs? The member for Ballarat. The minister has the call. Mr. Speaker, as I say again, an advertising campaign that is clearly targeting stopping the creation of 30,000 new jobs in the Australian economy. Now, is that the role of a trade union, I ask you? Now, again, Mr Speaker, yesterday uh, Doug Cameron has been in, in Parliament House and in the confines lobbying against this deal. Now, Mr Speaker, uh, this, particular, this particular union has been, has been nailed before, but not by the government, but by former leaders of the Labor Party. 
for, for the form that they've got. Mr. Speaker, we all remember in, we all remember in 1986. Minister, Minister, I'm just to resume his seat. Member for Brand on a point of order. The point of order is this, uh, Mr. Speaker. When debate is not to be anticipated, the normal interpretation of that is a fairly strict adherence to uh, various uh, to, to a description of uh, a process in relation to the Act, uh, a, an informing of the House of. Uh, of what order. might happen to the act when Minister, it is passed. But this is manifestly, a, Batman, this is manifestly a debate the around the act itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, all, of this, all of these matters are being raised in the debate as we, uh, as we handle it here currently, and they ought to be out of order. Let me um, order. Member for Batman. The mem let me respond to the member for Brand by indicating that I have been monitoring closely the remarks made by the minister, and he is in order. The minister has the call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Uh, Mr Speaker, and as I was saying, that uh, this particular organisation has form, uh, and that was identified in 1986 by the former Labor Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Paul Keating, when he accused the AMWU of having the scalps of 100,000 metal workers hanging from its belt. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and then this year, uh, the uh, Labor Premier of New South Wales, Bob Carr, uh, indicated uh, his view that uh, and likened Doug Cameron's ideas on trade policy to those of North Korea, uh, Mr. Speaker. And so, what the government is trying to do is to generate jobs from new export and trading opportunities across the world. Organisations like the AMWU are out to stop the generation of jobs because those jobs might end up with members in other unions and not theirs, Mr. Speaker. Now we should we should we should remember that uh, this uh, this Parliament should make up its own mind and not be and not be bullied by the unions of Australia, not be bullied by the unions, and not be bullied by the unions of Australia, the AMWU, the AWU, or the ACTU, Mr. Speaker. None of them, because. Because this Minister, men, order, Mr. order. The minister has the call. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the minister will resume his seat. Order. Order. Remove the man from the gallery. The member for Batman. The member for Batman is warned. The minister has the call. Just in in conclusion, uh, in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, the, the point remains that the government's trade policy objectives, uh, both bilateral and multilateral, about generating opportunities for Australia's exporters and jobs for Australians in the future, not stopping them. Yeah. Member for Griffith will resume his seat. For Griffith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Foreign Minister. In the recent AFP investigation of the leak of a top secret Ostia ONA document to the Herald Sun newspaper, can the Minister advise whether the AFP requested the telephone records, including mobile records, of the Minister's staff for the month of June 2003, and did the Minister's office provide all those records to the AFP? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Order, Member well, for Mr. Fowler. Speaker, if the Honourable Member wants to know how the Australian Federal Police conducted an investigation, my suggestion is that he should raise that with the Federal Police. Order. Um, but I, uh, of course, in this matter, have said on, in the House uh, during uh, this week that my office fully cooperates with the Federal Police on any matter, and there's never been an example where we haven't fully cooperated with them. But you see, the point here, the point here, Mr. Speaker, is a very interesting point. Member for Blacksland. It's a very interesting point. 
because the honourable member for Griffith has asked several questions over the last year about this document, and in those, in those questions he has revealed an intimate knowledge of the classification of the document, and the classification member of the document itself is classified. He could only know that. He could only know that classification if he had seen the document himself. Minister, and what would be interesting Minister, is how the member for Minister, Griffith knows so much about this Minister, document Minister, and who shot. The member for Griffith on a point of order. Yes, uh, Mr. Speaker. Understanding Order 145, I couldn't have crafted a simpler member question than I did, Griffith, which is about seat. phone. The member for Griffith, member for Flinders. The member for Watson is warned. Member for Ryan. Has the minister conclude his answer. The Honourable Member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Would the Minister outline to the House the Government's continued commitment to the three pillars of Medicare and how my alternative proposals damage the essential foundations of the Medicare system? What is the Government's response to this threat? The Honourable Minister for Health and Ageing, Leader of the House. Well, Mr Speaker, I do uh, thank the member for Megan uh, for her question because uh, uh, there are some threats to the Medicare system and I want to make it very clear uh, that as far as this government is concerned, we have one motto, don't mess with Medicare. And we say to members opposite, don't mess with Medicare. And Mr Speaker, I can say that this government fully supports the three pillars of Medicare. We support the Medicare benefit schedule. We support the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, we support the Australian health care agreements. We support these without question or without qualification. And Mr Speaker, we certainly don't support the establishment of a national health uh, reform uh, commission that would put bureaucrats in the driver's seat, bureaucrats, not patients, in the driver's seat over the MBS and the PBS. Now, Mr Speaker, let me remind the member for Lawler that she has made three major speeches in the last three months calling for the abolition of existing health programs and the pooling of this money in something reminiscent of the UK National Health Service at its worst. Mr Speaker, and three times, three times this week uh, she stood up and made uh, personal explanations to the effect that I said it but I didn't mean it, Mr Speaker. It's the please don't take me seriously defence. Uh, from the member from the member for Lawless. So Mr Speaker, you can imagine you can imagine my surprise when I got up this morning and I saw an article on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, a Labor plans Medicare smart card for all, exclusive, exclusive by Sue Dunleavy, and it says the ALP health policy unveiled yesterday. And then it says, Mr Speaker, in the ALP's health policy unveiled yesterday, I quote a controversial overhaul of health funding that would see federal and state funding for hospitals, aged care, rehabilitation and community care pooled, pooled and handed over to a regional health authority. Now, Mr. Speaker, who, who, who do you think linked that, Mr. Speaker? Who do you think linked that exclusively to suit unleavened? Well, it wasn't me, Mr. Speaker. It was, in fact, the member for Lawler, and I again, I again say to the member for Lawler, come clean about your plans. Come clean about your plans. She might, she might support the Medicare card, but she certainly doesn't support the Medicare system, Mr. Speaker. But of course, in all of this, she's just faithfully echoing. She's just faithfully echoing her master's voice. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, there was a, a proposal a while back from a professor, Dick Scotton. A Dick Scotton to pool all health funding. And Mr Speaker, none other than the Leader of the Opposition, the Member for Werriwa, said this of the Scotton proposal. 
It has the great benefit of pooling funding around the federal government. This is guiding stuff. This is the best way to develop health policy. This plan has so many advantages that it needs to be further development. I think it gives the best guide as to how we can now modernise Medicare and spread its success throughout the Australian health care. That was the Leader of the Opposition in this parliament. And Mr Speaker, this government does not want to modernise Medicare out of existence. This government supports Medicare. And Mr Speaker, the only thing that members opposite like about, its Medi about Medicare is the name, Mr Speaker. And I say to members opposite again and again, don't mess with Medicare. This government won't mess with Medicare, but I say to the Australian people, you can't trust Labor with your health. The Honourable Member for New England. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Are the project recommendations made to Cabinet by Invest Australia regarding the Australian Government's biofuels capital grants program the same projects that Cabinet endorsed? Will the Acting Prime Minister released, release Invest Australia's recommendations? <coughs> The Minister for Industry, Resources and Tourism. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, in terms of the submission to Cabinet, that is Cabinet in confidence, but can I assure the member for New England that the announced projects this week, the five projects for some $24.5 million, were done completely on commercial grounds? The Honourable Member for Kalgoorlie. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also addressed to the Minister for Industry, Tourism and Resources. Would the Minister update the House of Australia's performance in attracting major projects, investment and new jobs to Australia? Are there any alternative policies? The Honourable Minister for Industry, Tourism and Resources. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Kalgoorlie for his question and for his very strong interest in attracting investment not only to his seat of Kalgoorlie, which has done particularly well in recent times, but also to Australia. Now, Mr Speaker, this government stands for in investment, jobs and growth, and ABAIR recently had released a report which shows just how well we're delivering, Mr Speaker. In April 2004, uh, ABEAR released a list which showed there are some 192 projects, resource-based projects under development, of which some 62 are already under construction or committed to. Mr Speaker, this is a record number of projects in terms of, uh, in terms of projects at an advanced stage, and they underline the fact that, uh, that we are continuing to attract investment to the tune of some $21 billion in these projects alone. Mr Speaker, Invest Australia, a division of the Department of Industry, Tourism and Resources, has played a major role in attracting 96 of these projects worth some $15 billion. Mr Speaker, these projects have secured or created some 9,000 new jobs, Mr Speaker. What is the alternative to this? I'm asked by the member for Kalgoorlie, are there threats? Well, Mr Speaker, there are a long list of threats from the Labor Party in terms of investment and future investment in Australia. Mr Speaker, the first on that list, of course, is to abolish Invest Australia. Abolish the very body that has attracted 96 projects worth $15 billion and secured or created some 9,000 jobs, Mr Speaker. Now call on the Labor Party, Mr Speaker, as they're so good at now, to reverse that decision. <laughs> reverse that decision. Work with this government to attract investment here. Mr Speaker, secondly, Labor proposes a massive new tax on the resource sector, Mr Speaker, by winding back the diesel fuel excise rebate. Labor would increase the excise on the mining industry by $500 million, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I ask Labor in the interest of encouraging resource development in Australia to drop that proposal, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, thirdly, of course, and I know this is the member for Hunter's favourite policy, Mr Speaker, is the highly interventionist policy of use it or lose it on petroleum resource leases, Mr Speaker. There is no single policy that will frighten away investment 
in the uh, in the petroleum industry faster and uh, bring an end to exploration for oil and gas reserves than that policy, Mr Speaker. I asked the Labor Party to do a backflip on that policy, Mr Speaker, and stop Order. the damage Member that they're already doing. Mr Speaker, in terms of this government, this government has delivered the policy settings that are attracting a record amount of investment in Australia, Mr Speaker, and it's time that the Labor Party abandoned, did a triple backflip and abandoned the policies that were frightening investment away from Australia. It's time they reversed their decisions. It's time they joined with this government, adopted our policies and ensured that we continue the economic growth in Australia. The Honourable Member for Ballarat. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Environment and Heritage. Is the Minister aware of the front page report in the Ararat Advertiser on the 22nd of June stating that up to 750 jobs in the region could be at risk due to the government's refusal to increase the mandatory renewable energy target? Is the Minister also aware that, according to the rural city of Ararat, the government's policy could cost the region $960 million? Minister, isn't this just another example of how the government has failed rural and regional Australia? And will the minister now adopt Labor's policy to increase the emirate to 5 per cent so this investment and jobs lost won't, are not lost to the region? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Heritage. Mr Speaker, I, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for Ballarat for her question because it um, gives me the opportunity to once again remind the House of the enormous economic damage that the Labor Party's policy of a 5 per cent for target Hunter. for the mandatory renewable energy target scheme would bring. Uh, the, cost, the cost to the economy in lost GDP of the 5 per cent target would be of the order of $11.5 billion. Member for Wills. $11.5 billion. Uh, this uh, would have an enormous effect on jobs throughout the economy. Uh, it would have an enormously discouraging effect uh, on investment in jobs in regional Australia throughout the country. I warn it the would, it would put Wills. up electricity prices. Uh, and it would have, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, a very damaging effect. Now, the fact that the Labor Party refuses to concede this uh, impact of this extraordinary policy that it's got, which of course it supplements with a policy for a national emissions trading scheme, shows that the Labor Party simply does not understand why the Australian economy has been so successful over the last eight years. It's been successful over the last eight years because this government has pursued policies which keep taxes down, which encourage business, which encourage people to invest and to produce the wealth that we need to invest in improving our environment. We don't believe in putting on an economic hair shirt, devastating the Australian economy for no real environmental gains, but adopting policies which have very damaging effects right throughout regional Australia. And I advise the member for Ballarat to stop this scare talk, to stop promulgating this scare talk, and to recognise that the enormous encouragement given to renewable energy technologies in the energy and environment statement, particularly to wind and other key technologies for regional Australia, if taken up by the industry, can only be beneficial to the commercial adoption of those technologies. The Honourable Member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I address my question to the Minister for Small Business and Tourism. And my question is, Mr Speaker, would the Minister inform the House how unfair dismissal laws cost jobs and stifle economic growth? Is the Minister aware of any recent support for reforms to the unfair dismissal laws or other alternative views? The Minister for Small Business and Tourism. Got dressed in the dark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I want to take the opportunity to thank the member for O'Connor for being a champion for small business. 
He comes straight out of the trench and takes on the Labor Party who are out to crush small business in Australia. And the member for uh, O'Connor has long been an advocate for good small business activity, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, my attention has been drawn to a uh, report from Australian Business Limited, a survey of their members, which has been released today, that identifies uh, uh, the significant impact of the current unfair dismissal laws on small business. Uh, it says uh, the impact of unfair dismissals legislation was identified by 75 per cent of respondents as a major or moderate concern. Now, I know that doesn't bother the member for Rankin. Uh, the member for Rankin, who is in the vanguard of the fight of the union movement, to do everything it can to close down casual employment. The member for Jager Jager said it's better not to have a job than to be employed casually. Uh, and uh, really? that's what the member for Jager Jager said. It is better not to have a job than to have a casual job. Wouldn't it wouldn't an astounding, wouldn't it, wouldn't it astounding comment to make? For all those people working on farms in casual employment, in restaurants, in cafes, in the hotel industry, Mr. Speaker, right across the economy, and the member for Jagger Jagger is saying that it's far better, far better for them not to have a job than to have casual employment, Mr. Speaker. And I keep asking myself, why does the Labor Party keep fighting against member us Bruce, on the reform of the unfair dismissal yeah, law? Why do they? Order. I keep Minister asking that question, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I thought, Mr. Speaker, it must have something to do with the composition of the Labor Party's front bench, oh. because the leader of the opposition has never worked in business, Mr. Speaker, full time, never worked in business. The leader of the opposition. We can't find if the deputy leader of the opposition has ever worked in business, Mr. Speaker. The shadow treasurer. The member for Hotham has never worked in business. Never worked in business. The shadow minister for small business has never worked in business. Unless you call Centenary House a business. It's a business, all right. Oh, it's a business. Order. The minister has the call. It's a property portfolio. Order. The minister, minister addresses Speaker. remarks through the chair. And Mr. Speaker, we long for the days of Barney Cooney. We wish that Barney Cooney who was the sole champion of small business for that's right he was a barrister the speaker but senator barney cooney was in fact the last labor senator to ever work in small business the speaker 80 percent of the labor senators 80 percent of the labor senators are former trade union officials 80 percent mr speaker so mr speaker so Mr. Speaker, I heard some Maranoa. recent comments from the former Senator Chris Schott, Mr. Speaker, who was himself shot, really, was he? Mr. Speaker, Chris Schott, and Mr. Speaker, he had some refreshing words. He identified that the Labor Party had changed its tune on its recruitment to the Senate. He said, and he, in, in, in the passing of saying that he's making the Labor Party's making great strides in changing the makeup of its senators, he said, and listen to this, he said. We are replacing male trade union officials with female trade union officials. That's, that's, what, that's balancing it up. That's balancing it up. Balance Mr. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, and he, uh, Mr. Speaker, we thank him for that, Mr. Speaker. But we also thank the member for Chifley for his comments <laughs> yesterday, Mr. Speaker, because the member for Chifley, as we remind the House, the member for Chifley yesterday said that the government should be able to govern. Well, on more than 40 occasions. The Labor Party has opposed our attempts to free Australia's 1.2 million small businesses from the burden of the unfair dismissal laws. On more than 40 occasions, well, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we asked the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker, we asked the Labor Party to stop doing a Roger to small business, Mr. Speaker. We want the Labor Party to do a Roger to their own policy on the unfair dismissals legislation pass our legislation and give small business a chance to employ more people. Do you remember for rank? Thank you, Mr Speaker. I asked the minister to table the Australian business survey that he was just waving around, which reveals that the greatest concern of small member business for, is tax, your tax, for Rankin, and the second greatest Rankin, is red tape. Resume his seat. So what, you're going to roll back the Honourable Member for Capricornia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Environment and Heritage. 
Is the minister aware that the government's energy statement identifies four areas adjacent to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park as high priority Order. for oil exploration? In the face of overwhelming community, business and industry opposition to oil exploration and mining on or near the reef, how can the minister justify jeopardising Queensland's tourism and fishing industries, as well as the natural values of the largest coral reef system in the world, which provides an annual boost of over $2 billion to the Australian economy? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Heritage. Mr Speaker, it's hard to express how grateful I am to receive that question uh, from the Labor Party, uh, because I've been intrigued uh, by statements of the Leader of the Labor Party that have been, Member for Hunter. That, that have been repeated just now uh, in the question uh, by the member. And, uh, th these statements are that the Labor Party will ban listen to this the Labor Party will ban exploration and drilling on or near the Great Barrier Reef. Now, Mr Speaker, um, the fact is that uh, drilling on the Great Barrier Reef is prevented by law under the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act 1975. The member in, for in, Macmillan. In, in other words, since 1975, drilling on the reef has been prevented. And yet the Leader of the Opposition is going around telling the Australian people that he's going to do something about this. He, he, he's, he is either completely ignorant of the laws or utterly dishonest and deceitful in what he says about the protection of the Great Barrier Reef, because he is undertaking to do something which has been law in this country for over 25 years. Uh, Mr Speaker, then, then we have concerns being expressed about uh, possible dangers to the reef from drilling off the reef. Now, this government has introduced the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Legislation, which specifically empowers the Minister for the Environment to prevent any action which could have any detrimental effect on the values of the Great Barrier Reef. And of course, this legislation completely protects the reef from any of the activities which the member is implying may possibly uh, have an adverse impact on the tourism and other industries within the reef. The government which has protected the Great Barrier Reef more than any government in Australia's history is this government. The member for is, is this government. And uh, on July the 1st, I'm delighted to be able to say that the new zoning plan for the Great Barrier Reef will come into operation and it will lift the protections of the Great Barrier Reef from some 5 per cent of the marine park to over 33 per cent of the marine park. And it's very interesting, Mr Speaker, what uh, the major interests concerned with the reef have said about the government's policies. The Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators, uh, the industry quoted by the member, says, I doubt that I will see a more important conservation effort in the world anywhere in my lifetime. The Game Fishing Association of Australian uh, Research and Development Foundation says the Minister and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority have listened to the concerns expressed by hundreds of game fishers from all over Australia, restoring faith in the public consultation process. The recreational fishing body Sunfish, through its chair Bill Turner, has said, just like we've stopped the rape and pillage of the rainforest, we think the same should apply to the Great Barrier Reef. And Sir David Attenborough has said, the Australian people are increasing protection for one of the natural wonders of the world. In other words, Mr Speaker, this government is the government that has put in place the protections that the Great Barrier Reef requires, and what we have on the other side of the House is deceitful and misleading statements promising the Australian people that they will do things which have been law in this country for almost 30 years. The Honourable Member for Barker. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and Regional Services. My question is, would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House of progress being made towards a national water initiative so important to the Murray-Darling system, and why is it important that COAG uh, meeting reaches agreement on this issue. 
The Acting Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. Tomorrow presents us as a nation with a historic opportunity to respond and confirm a vast respond to and confirm a vast amount of work that's been done over the last ten months in developing what I believe is the bedrock uh, for the world's best water management framework, which is indeed appropriate in a continent as dry as ours. Uh, Mr Speaker, if agreed, this will give the investment certainty needed to underpin economic and environmental futures in this country. It will provide pathways for a return to sustainability in over-allocated systems. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this, uh, these very important objectives can happen uh, only with the goodwill and commitment of the states in whom constitutional power in this state for water is vested. Mr Speaker, we provided the leadership necessary to make it happen. I trust that tomorrow the states will be able to ensure that they have put aside their remaining differences and we can secure this very important outcome for Australia and for future Australians. On that note, Mr Speaker, I ask that further questions be placed yeah. on the notice paper.